we could uh, begin uh, our last uh, session today. Uh, I think this has been uh, a really memorable conference, not only because of, uh, uh, because of uh, uh, Andy Murray's wonderful win on Sunday. Uh, in fact, I think probably, uh, if I think about it, the, probably the only person here who has lived through three Wimbledon winners is myself, being born in 1936, the year that Fred Perry last uh, won first of all in Virginia and now uh, Andy. Um, <clears throat> in fact, uh, Fred Perry went to the same school as myself, and in 1950, he and Dan Maskell turned up to do a demonstration, uh, a demonstration of their wonderful tennis skills. So there we are, it's a historical <laughs> moment. <laughs> Um, well, it's a, 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 a tremendous pleasure to be able to welcome, uh, uh, to be able to welcome Jane Barlow, uh, to, who's going to talk about early intervention. She's Professor of Public Health in the early years at the University of Warwick, <coughs> Director of the Warwick Infant and Family Wellbeing Unit, and her main research interest is the role of early parenting in the etiology of mental health problems and the evaluation of early interventions at improving uh, parenting practices, reducing the risk of child maltreatment. So, <coughs> Jane. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you all very much for uh, staying past the tea break in the afternoon. <laughs> I'm going to be echoing some of the things that uh, Minna and Duncan have been saying, and some of the things that I suspect some of the speakers the, uh, were saying this morning. And I want to talk really about uh, neglect during the uh, first three years and I want to focus a little bit on why the first three years are so important and to define very clearly what we mean by um, neglectful parenting during this time and what the impact of uh, this might be albeit that the research I think isn't sufficiently sophisticated at this point in time to distinguish uh, very clearly between uh, you know emotional abuse more generally and uh, neglect and you know where does one begin and the other, uh, the other continue. So what does neglectful parenting during this, this period involve? And then I want to conclude by describing to you a new care pathway that we've set up in um, Oxfordshire with the aim of um, addressing some of the uh, things that uh, Harriet was talking about uh, this morning in terms of more uh, timely decision making in the, uh, in the early years. So what is it about the early years that is so important? Well, we're beginning to recognise now that the key task of infancy is the infant's growing capacity for what we call affect regulation. And this refers to their ability to uh, regulate themselves emotionally. And parents, of course, play a key role in facilitating this, and they do it via what we call this dyadic regulation of affect that takes place as a uh, consequence of the um, attachment relationship that kicks in uh, uh, at about six or seven months. Of, of, of age. And the two biological systems that uh, facilitate this, the parental caregiving system, which I think actually uh, begins to kick in right back in pregnancy with, uh, with maternal reflective function, and um, of course the infant attachment system that, that begins to kick in during the early months of life. And one of the key messages that I'm, I'm constantly uh, reiterating, and people must be getting a tad tired of me saying it, but um, I'm going to say it again anyway, I think that one of the uh, key goals really of advanced society should be to increase the number of children who we have uh, that are securely attached. We currently only have two thirds of children that are securely attached. So what is it about the early years that's particularly important? Well, of course, infants are uh, exposed to high levels of stress. Some of this stress comes from their internal uh, uh, situation, their hunger, discomfort. Uh, some of it is triggered by um, external uh, sources of stress. And this very nice uh, paper by Shonkoff in 2009, you can see uh, they distinguish between positive stress, which is normative, brief, mild, moderate in, in magnitude, and uh, with good enough parenting, uh, this sort of stress enables the uh, infant to develop. 
Then there's tolerable stress. This is non-normative. This is where things impact on the family that are detrimental in some way. Uh, you know, the house burns down or there's a breakup in a relationship. Uh, again, with, uh, you know, sufficient and good enough parental input, uh, this is tolerable for the, for the infant. But then we have toxic stress, and toxic stress is strong, frequent, uh, prolonged activation of the infant stress response system. And I think the thing that characterises this is that it occurs in families where there is significant stress, so uh, significant postnatal, chronic postnatal depression or more severe mental health problems, substance dependency of some sort, or, uh, or, or domestic violence. And the key thing that defines these situations is that these adults um, are so preoccupied with regulating their own internal states that they are not able to um, help the infant to regulate theirs. And not only can they not help the infant to regulate the normal uh, stresses that they're exposed to, but actually these situations are exposing these infants to uh, even more stress that then is um, unregulated. And the evidence really around this is, is quite clear, that toxic stress has a significant impact on the uh, rapidly developing uh, central nervous system of the infant, the brain, uh, it affects the architecture of it, it affects its uh, structure, and it also affects its uh, functioning. And you can see here I've listed very briefly learning, behaviour, physiology, um, all of these things are impacted by infants being exposed to toxic levels of stress during the uh, during the early years. And then we've got this very nice evidence that shows you know, stress-related chronic disease, unhealthy lifestyles and widening health disparities from some very nice longitudinal studies. And attachment really is the mechanism by which infants are able to regulate themselves uh, in terms of the stress. So you can see here two-thirds of, of our children or our infants are securely attached. These infants have had responsive caregiving uh, when particularly at times uh, when they were distressed. Um, you can see here that two-thirds of infants are insecurely attached, so this group here are what we call anxious resistant. These children have had uh, caregiving that was uh, chaotic and that failed really to uh, meet their needs for comfort. And unconsciously, these children have learned that in order to maintain closeness to this uh, mum that's a bit erratic, a bit in inconsistent, a bit intrusive, uh, that these children need to upregulate themselves. And so you can see them in nursery settings. Settings. They're, they're, they're very clingy, uh, quite demanding, quite, you know, very, very, very excessively talking all the time and unable to be comforted, really, when you, when you offer them comfort. And actually, you know, when you look at the uh, cortisol levels of these children, you can see that they still have very high circulating cortisol levels, even though this defensive strategy has kicked in and they've, uh, you know, they've achieved closeness with the parental caregiver. So it's not an effective strategy, really, in terms of lowering their... Uh, their stress levels. And neither is this avoidance strategy. These children have been exposed to early care caregiving and that was in some sense uh, rejecting. And they've learned that they need really to down-regulate themselves in times of stress in order to maintain closeness. So these children look as if there's no problem, essentially. Everything's absolutely fine. But actually, of course, everything isn't absolutely fine because they are uh, having to... They are sacrificing the, the, their development, if you like, in order to meet the needs of this parent. So that's essentially uh, these children who are securely attached have got a parent that's meeting their needs whereas these children who are insecurely attached are having to adapt to themselves, if you like, uh, to their, parent, their parents' behaviour. And then we've got this disorganised category of attachment. 80% of children who are uh, abused or neglected during, uh, at some point during their lives have a disorganised um, attachment. And these children have experienced such chaotic or frightening or neglectful uh, caregiving that they ha actually haven't been able to um, establish a, a, a regular behaviour behavioural strategy. And this is the evidence, really, around the long-term outcomes. It's really quite conclusive. So secure attachment, children have much more optimal functioning across all of these outcomes. Insecure attachment, and this is a nice systematic review that follows uh, uh, children through into adulthood. Less optimal functioning, again, across all, all domains. Um, but not disastrous. You know, a third of us here will be insecurely attached. We, you know, we get by one way or another. Disorganised attachment, however, is a bit of a disaster for children. Uh, 
uh, you saw that nice video clip there uh, of that little girl who's, who's disorganised. Significant dysfunction, significant later psychopathology. These very nice systematic reviews have um, confirmed, really, the association between disorganised attachment and later functioning. So what is neglectful parenting in the first three years of life? The evidence around what sort of parenting is needed in order for children to uh, thrive really is, is, is pretty conclusive. Back in the late 1990s, we had this very nice systematic review that showed that parents who are sensitive and who are attuned, uh, particularly when their child's distressed, um, have children who are uh, securely attached. But this wasn't all of the story and uh, explained roughly only about a third of the variants. So we've had a lot of research that's occurred since then that has really focused on you know, what are the missing parts of this, this jigsaw puzzle, if you like. And we've got very nice research from Beatrice Beebe who refers to the importance of interaction that occurs within what she calls this mid-range. So it's neither too passive at one end and it's neither too too um, intrusive at the other. And then we've got this very nice research uh, that's already been uh, very nicely highlighted, thank you very much, on mentalisation and reflective function. Um, Peter Fonagy, uh, Elizabeth Mines up in Durham also refers to it as uh, mind-mindedness. Mm -hmm. And I don't, have, I don't really have a lot of time to uh, talk in a great detail about these, but these aspects of parental functioning are absolutely key to uh, children uh, uh, achieving uh, optimal functioning. And really, uh, the key mechanism, if you like, or the key process by which this takes place is something called affect synchrony. It's um, a process uh, of synchrony where there is emotional uh, connection between the primary caregiver and the infant, followed by rupture, followed by followed by repair. And this kicks in about two months of age because at this point the primary caregiver's face becomes the primary source of visual and emotional communication. And infants are exposed to very significant uh, levels of cognitive and social information and stimulation as a result of the face-to-face -face exchanges that go on during this period. And I'm going to show you what this looks like in a video clip in a, in a minute. But the key thing is this process of synchrony, rupture and uh, repair. And essentially, um, children who, uh, whose parents are not able to do this are left exposed really to uh, you know, very toxic levels of uh, stress that I've just uh, described. I should just thank the NSPCC there because they uh, joined in with making this video with us. So it was a, a joint Warwick NSPCC uh, app which is going to be available in a month's time alongside a, uh, a related website which is uh, for practitioners. But you could see there that lovely process of affect synchrony, rupture where the infant looks away, mum is uh, very sensitive uh, and she waits till the baby comes back and then they re-engage with, re with one another. And sometimes... Uh, what you see in, in parents where that isn't working is, is mum gets very anxious when the infant looks away and there's this desperate game of, of chase and dodge going on because mum follows the infant's face and the infant's trying to disengage and you know that level of repeated interaction, that level of repeated intrusiveness really results in, is, is one of the factors contributing to insecure attachment. So what happens in the face of parental problems? Well, where you've got things um, such as uh, mental health problems, substance abuse, the toxic, the toxic trio, of course, and I also uh, refer, of course, to unresolved uh, loss in the parent because, of course, unresolved loss in the parent very often um, underpins uh, many of these uh, uh, mental health problems that, that we see. And what happens is that the infant's distress really triggers very severe levels of distress in these in these parents and their interaction becomes characterized either on the one hand by um, omission whereby they withdraw it becomes distancing or neglectful and on the other hand um, a very intrusive form of parent infant interaction which I'll show you on a on a video clip in a minute which you know once the child gets a bit a bit older takes the form of you know blaming shaming um, punishing and attacking but actually what you find in infancy is that parents very often alternate between those, those two states. So they, they might be very um, neglectful one moment and dissociated, or, and then they might switch into uh, you know, very uh, intrusive parent-infant interaction that is uh, frightening. 
And we've got this, this we've coined this term, Main and Hess coined the term FR behaviour. It's also referred to as hostile and helpless. So these parents are emotionally frightened, but they behave in ways that are emotionally frightening to the infant. And they're frightening because um, these are what we call atypical or anomalous parenting behaviours. So, you know, this is a very active sort of emotionally abusive behaviour where it's, you know, the parent might suddenly loom into the infant's face and uh, shout at them or there might be these more sort of neglectful uh, patterns of behaviour that are uh, around the, you know, this failure to repair, a lack of response um, and these um, effective communication errors which is where there is a failure if you like of the process of mirroring that you, Duncan, referred to earlier. We recognise the importance of marked mirroring in, 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 in infants and where that uh, uh, fails. We call this you know, where the mother laughs and the infant is distressed um, that is uh, what we call an effective communication errors. And very, very significant evidence, this lovely systematic review that shows a strong association between these sorts of atypical or disorganised, sorry, these sorts of atypical behaviours and disorganised attachment at 12 and 18 months of age. So just to say something very quickly about the maltreatment, I haven't put a reference on here because there's so much out there, but very significant uh, association between uh, overdevelopment of the brain stem and the midbrain, so the, this explains why these children are anxious, impulsive, poor affect regulation and hyperactive. They have poor problem solving as a result of deficits in their cortical uh, regions and it also impacts their limbic function. And you can see these children have a poor capacity for empathy right from, you know, right from two years of age. And this is the slide that I showed you earlier. These children uh, finish up in this category down here which is um, disorganised. And the reason that disorganised, the reason that these attachment patterns are important is that attachment isn't only a behavioural process, it, it results in internal working models. So infants actually are mapping the world, they're little contingency detectors and they're using an unconscious part of the brain called procedural memory and they're using that procedural memory to map the interactions that are taking place between themselves and their primary caregivers. And these maps are built up, they're built up in into a set of messages that says who I am as a person, am I lovable, do people respond to me when I get distressed, um, and what other people around me are like, so myself in interactions with other people. And these internal working maps are what enable us as adults really to engage with other people, they're what set up our set of our expectations in relation to who we are and who other people are. And there's very, very significant uh, continuity over time in terms of early attachment patterns and uh, later attachment patterns in the absence of a change in caregiving. So for children who are disorganised, they, they, they uh, have ch caregivers are perceived to be unpredictable and rejecting. They, of course, extrapolate from this to other people around them who they perceive to be frightening, dangerous and unavailable. They perceive themselves as unlovable, unworthy. They cause, feel they cause other people to become angry. And these children spend <coughs> the bulk of their time in states of either fear, shame or anger. And the environment triggers them very, very quickly into these states. It takes very little upset in the environment to cause these children to become deeply ashamed, deeply fearful. You saw it on that video clip there with that little girl. And these children then go on to develop the sorts of coercive strategies that Minna, uh, Minna talked about, compulsive uh, controlling strategies and compulsive caregiving. And this is the sort of arousal pattern that you get. So uh, the, this yellow line shows the sort of normal ups and downs, the normal arousal pattern. But these children are in environments. This toxic stress triggers these children children over this upper window of tolerance into this fight or flight mode and these are the sort of long term defensive strategies that kick in and then actually if you can't do anything if nobody rescues you from this early environment then all you can do really is to uh, dissociate and that is these children then dip down into these uh, states of you know severe hypo arousal um, and then you know back up into fight or flight and when that doesn't work back down into hypo arousal and this very nice long term study shows the sorts of long-term behaviours that, you know, if you're disorganised at one year, you don't get any intervention, then you're likely to be have these sorts of problems when you're six. 
and I've just shown you that. So I really want to uh, talk to you now about Oxpub. Um, I, I just want to mention the NSPCC have funded us to do a to look at pre-birth assessment uh, process, and I can't talk to you about that today because we're still in the uh, well, we're only halfway through essentially. Um, but what, what I just so I just wanted to describe to you this pre-birth um, assessment process that we've set up in um, Oxfordshire. Caroline Newbold, who talked earlier, is the uh, the manager for it, and. Um, essentially, it's a, a care pathway that involves intensive assessment, intensive intervention within the uh, uh, within the uh, period up to from pregnancy up to eight months of age. And the aim really is that we make more timely uh, decisions in terms of whether this infant and mum are going to uh, make it. Really, in terms of com com you know not removing the infant. So antenatally, these infants are referred at 18 weeks which is significantly earlier than infants get referred in other places. I think it's sometimes as late as uh, 36 weeks. Um, they get intensive assessment once they've been referred and then the PUP intervention begins antenatally for three months and it's delivered by this team of social workers who have social workers and family support workers who've received specialist <laughs> training in the parents under pressure intervention. At birth there is an assessment of the parent infant interaction, uh, we've got concurrent foster care um, available where necessary and the aim of that really is to avoid the sort of double jeopardy uh, that Harriet referred to earlier where she described uh, children who are you know, already traumatised being removed from these early caregiving settings into a new setting and then repeatedly removed uh, across foster care and so which of course uh, uh, traumatises them again. And then over the next eight months, assuming the infant hasn't already been removed, we continue with this intervention, clear <coughs> goals that are to be achieved, we're reassessing regularly and uh, we're removing infants where there's insufficient improvement uh, before eight months of age. And so this is what it looks like. Essentially, step one is a cross-sectional assessment of the uh, parent's current functioning. And we're using a range of uh, standardised psychological assessments uh, to do this. They're standardised tools uh, that are available for uh, practitioners to use. But I think really we do need a change of mindset, particularly within social work profession, because I just feel there's a strong resistance to the use of some of these uh, uh, you know, very good standardised tools that should be used alongside uh, professional judgment and of course an assessment of the parent-child interaction. So these are some of the tools that we're using as part of the antenatal assessment. Uh, we're using the antenatal promotional interview as a general sort of framework for uh, working in partnership with the parents. At three, three monthly assessment, we're looking at the parent's mental health. We've got a life event scale. We've got a drug and alcohol screen. Uh, we've got a domestic abuse screen. Uh, we're looking at so, uh, stress, parenting stress. Sorry, that's after the baby's born. Reflective function. So once uh, during the antenatal period, and I'm not sure that we're doing it once again postnatally. Caroline will correct me on that. Uh, we're doing the parent development interview, which looks at the parent's capacity for uh, reflective function. And we attach a lot of significance to this really because I think there's very nice evidence emerging to suggest that this is uh, strongly predictive really of whether the uh, parent is going to be able to parent this child. The aim, of course, really over the subsequent intervention period is to improve the uh, interaction and to improve the uh, capacity of the, 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 the parent in terms of mentalisation, and I'll tell you um, a bit more about that in a minute. Once the baby's born, we do an assessment of parent-infant interaction, which is a three-minute video clip, um, which is then coded using the uh, care index. And um, you can have members of the team that are qualified to, uh, uh, to score it, but actually we're sending it out to be uh, scored and you can get court level reliability on these care index codings from externally rated practitioners um, you know for a cost of about 80 quid which is is absolutely nothing and you know this is phenomenally important because you know by using the care index in relation to that uh, piece of video clip that you just saw we were able to say this infant is compulsively compliant uh, which means that he is uh, you know actually frightened of the uh, frightened of the care giver. So we're assessing the home environment using the home inventory, looking at the mother's feelings about the relationship with the baby using the mother object relationship scale and we're also assessing parenting stress using the uh, parenting stress index.
So we do this time one assessment. The next step really is to uh, define what we're calling these uh, tar targets for change and we're using goal attainment scaling uh, to do this and um, goal attainment scaling really means um, being very clear with the family um, what improvement would look like, uh, what deterioration would look like and what it would look like if they stayed the same. So you can see we've got um, each of our goals uh, specified very clearly um, across the top and then we've got this uh, scale down the side and sometimes we, you can put a numeric value to this so um, we have naught for the most likely outcome which is there's absolutely no change. You get plus one if there's more than expected change, plus two if there's significantly more and then minus one and minus two. So actually you can use this sort of goal attainment scaling to uh, develop a sort of quantitative uh, measure if you like of um, how well the family is doing that you can use alongside um, you know your clinical judgment and all the other sorts of uh, data that you're collecting. Step three then is to intervene with this family and uh, what we're doing is an intensive home-based home uh, in, uh, programme that really is aimed at addressing the specific problems of uh, the family. And we're doing that using the Parents Under Pressure programme. Um, it comprises uh, an intensive manualised home-based intervention. There's ten modules and these modules can be used flexibly really uh, depending on what the uh, the individual family's needs are. And the thing that I like about this, like Minna said really, is the sort of ecological model that underpins this really. So it's not just about working with uh, the parent's mental health, the parent-infant interaction. It's really about saying, you know, has this family got housing problems? What is the wider context really that might be adding to these, uh, to these parents' Um, issues. I really like the fact that this has got a very strong focus on uh, the development of mindfulness really and mindfulness isn't the same as mentalization. Mindfulness really is about helping the uh, parent to develop affect regulation uh, strategies really. So many of these parents are substance dependent, got a whole range of uh, issues in relation to their ability to regulate themselves and so these mindfulness skills are aimed really at helping them to uh, to manage that affect regulation better. There's very nice evidence from an RCT uh, with substance abusing parents of children aged two to eight years to show um, very significant uh, improvements in parental functioning, reduction in uh, the risk of child abuse. And in fact, the NSPCC are funding a uh, trial of the Parents Under Pressure Programme currently with uh, substance dependent parents of children aged um, naught to two, which I should say is separate from this uh, work that we're doing with um, OxPIP here. These are some of the other evidence-based interventions because I don't want you to go away with the impression that parents under pressure is the only program that you could use uh, during this period. Uh, there's very nice evidence around um, all of these, uh, video interaction guidance, there's lovely evidence recently, 2011, to show that uh, working with uh, abusing and neglectful parents of young children who were disorganized using video interaction guidance was very effective in improving the uh, in shifting the disorganized attachment back to secure <coughs> then there's parent infant psychotherapy uh, which is very intensive uh, uh, method of working really with a focus on changing the parents internal working models then we've got these very nice parenting programs uh, of which parents under pressure is one and I should just say that many of these programs are sort of multimodal so the parents under pressure program ha uses video interaction uh, feedback as well and then we've got things such as parent child interaction therapy and of course the family drug and alcohol courts and so then step four is to come back and to uh, to do our final assessment. So we re-administer at different points our standardised measures, um, our direct observations of changes in relation to the goal attainment scaling, and of course the other things that we take into account are the parents' willingness to engage and to cooperate with the intervention and the extent to which um, targets were achieved. And so we're still in the very early stages of that. Uh, we're doing some, we've got a, a, a nice controlled study uh, around it. I don't know whether you want to say anything, Caroline, about the sorts of families that we've got going through it. I'm putting you on the spot here, aren't I now? But um, we could do that at the end. We are at the end. <laughs>
those are the publications. So that is the end. <laughs>